Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. How great thou art. One more time. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. God is worthy of our worship. Amen. Amen. There's none like him. And uh, what a great God we have. Um, We've had a wonderful series in the Gospel of John. We're going to turn a page this morning and, and talk about the Bible. One of the things, before, quickly before I get to that, we've heard us talk about Uganda. Uh, we've got a group of about 25 people all together going on two different teams to Uganda in about, well, uh, four Sundays from now, about 27 days, I think we leave. At least the first team leaves. My wife and I, in case you're new and don't know, uh, years ago we began kind of a part-time missionary work. Uh, we consider ourselves volunteer missions, missionaries, I'll put it that way. We work in Kampala. We've established a non-profit. Uh, primarily what we do is we work with one church over there. We help build an orphanage. Uh, they have a primary school and, uh, well, nursery school, primary school, high school. Uh, we basically work on getting kids scholarships, sponsorships, uh, so that kids can get uh, an education. Uh, the kids themselves, they, they receive, um, you know, uniforms, their supplies, their tuition. Uh, we feed them food every day, uh, which is a big deal for some. It's the only meal that they get uh, for, for, for most of the kids there. Uh, we're, we've also teach them about Christ. It's a Christian school, uh, so we, we have worship every week, and uh, there's, there's chapel, and we tell them about Jesus, and uh, we go in there and share the gospel with kids. These are, some of them are Muslim kids uh, whose parents uh, can't afford school, but they'll send their kids to our school because of the uh, uh, quality and the uh, price of the education there, and so uh, we, that's a little bit about our mission, but pray for us. The names of the people who are going uh, are inside your bulletin, and every week uh, we'll probably just do a little nugget. Just to, I, I want you guys to be praying for us as we go. Uh, my wife and I will be gone for four Sundays, um, which is longest we've ever gone. But we've just had so many people that wanted to go this time that we said, okay, let's try two teams back to back. Which uh, I'm thankful for, but I hope never happens again because it's a lot of work. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. Uh, today we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God. And, and listen, we turn our attention to the Word of God every week. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you a little warning. Uh, when you come to church at Valley Point Church, we always preach from the Bible. Uh, no, we're not going to preach from the Reader's Digest or something different today. Uh, but instead of preaching from the Bible today, I'm going to talk about the Bible. This is going to be less of a sermon and more of a, I don't know, a seminar, a conference, or presentation or something. Because here at Valley Point Church, we, we stand on the Bible as our source of faith. Uh, unapologetically, we do. If you come into our worship service, the Bible is going to be uh, the majority of the time that we spend. We need to spend time singing and worshiping and uh, because God is worthy of that and something happens when we gather corporately, but we teach from the Bible in our worship service. If you go to a small group, like a life group, you will discover that the Bible is is uh, the majority of the time. We're opening God's Word. If you go to the men's ministry or the women's ministry, we're opening up the Bible. If you go to a home group, we're teaching the Bible. If you're being discipled one-on-one, it's about the Bible. If you go to the youth group or the kids' ministries, are you getting the picture here? Why? Because this is the Word of God. And we believe it's the Word of God and the source for all truth and the foundation of our faith. The Bible itself makes a claim that it was written by God several places. Second Peter 1 is, is one where it says that no scripture, no prophecy of scripture was ever made by an act of human will, meaning human beings did not write this book, but men moved by the Spirit, spoke from God. Now, yes, God used human beings, and they weren't just sitting there in a trance like, God's moving my hand, and, and I have no idea what I'm writing, okay? Uh, but men, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote, and as they wrote, their words were inspired. Or in fact, we use the word God breathed, because in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, again, the Bible says that the Bible, all Scripture, 
is inspired by God. And that word inspired by God literally means oh, God breathed. This is the word of God uh, and is profitable for correction, for training, for reproof, for teaching, uh, training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be adequate. We believe that the Bible is sufficient, meaning that all of the big questions in life are answered in this book. Origin. Where did I come from? Purpose. Why am I here? Hope. Future. What's going to happen when I die? How should I live? We believe that the Bible is infallible. That means in its original writing was without mistakes, no errors. Uh, we believe it's complete. That is, that there are 66 books in this Bible and you don't want to be adding a book number 67 to it. Uh, that, that God's word is complete. There are no missing books from this. It is authoritative and God's word has the final say. And by the way, for me, it is a beautiful thing that I don't have to overthink my faith. I just have to open up the word and see what it says and then I'm challenged with the question, am I going to believe this and then act on it? I don't have to make up in my own brain. I wonder whether or not I believe this to be true. See, I don't believe the Bible is a buffet table where you can say, well, I like this or I don't like this and, you know, let's rip that part out because that doesn't apply anymore, you know. Now, I didn't always believe the Bible. This picture of my wife and I was taken a few months before we got married. Um, uh, this was, uh, we were married by the man in the middle, Ken Farmer. He performed our, our wedding. Uh, this was 1987. For you younger people, they did have color photos back then. Um, and yes, I still had hair back then. Although you can tell it's receding. It's getting a little thin up top. But about a year before this photo, I had come out of drug treatment center and I began to try to work a 12-step program to find a higher power in my life because that's what the 12-step program said I needed. And I started dating Tammy, who was a Christian. And I remember a conversation when I began to think, okay, well, how am I going to know what the truth is about God? And, and if there is a God who created everyone in the world... And he just left it up for everybody in their own minds to figure out who he was. That's a messed up plan. I mean, what if I was born in a Muslim family? Then I would believe that. If I was born in a Hindu family, I'd believe that. How do you know who's right? And even if you're a Christian, there's like all these different denominations and things. How do you know what the truth is? And Tammy said to me, well, God preserved his word in writing so that we could know what the truth is. And I said, well, the Bible's filled with all kinds of mistakes because I've seen the show on a Discovery Channel or something like that. And my wife's pretty spunky, so she said, show me one. <laughs> well, I'd never actually read the Bible before. I just knew I couldn't trust it. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take you up on your challenge. And I began reading the Bible uh, primarily to convince myself that this was not the Word of God. And in the course of studying and reading, God began to do something in my heart, and I became convinced. And again, it made sense to me. Logically, it makes sense that God has put and preserved everything in truth in His Word. So it's up to us whether we believe it, or reject it, uh, you know, whatever it is. It's written in Scripture, that, so the truth is available for all. Now today, what we're going to do is quickly put the Bible on trial and ask the question, if I were to ask you the question, is this the Word of God? Of course, you're in church, and you know the right answer is yes, or Jesus. Jesus or yes is usually the right answer. Um, which, uh, yes, and, I'm, and perhaps my concern, uh, you know, I've been a pastor for three decades, and what I've seen in the church is that we don't value this book, we don't know this book like we used to. I think that the culture around us is tearing down this word. And with the information age and all the things you can get on your phone, there's all these different attacks on the Bible because it is the foundation of our faith. If the enemy could discredit this book, then he can cause you to doubt whether or not it's true. And our culture around us no longer believes that the Bible is the truth. And in my experience, I'm not trying to diss anybody, but the Christian church, even our church, we don't know the Bible. I mean, if we were indicted for believing that the Bible was the Word of God, would there be enough evidence to convict us? 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Do we really study it? Do we really know it? Do we really try to live by it? Do we put ourselves under it? I remember Kevin and April. I can't remember their last names. You guys who've been here a long time. What's that? McDaniels, that's right. Kevin McDaniels one time gave a testimony and he got up here one time and he says, I realize I shouldn't read the Bible like this. I need to read it like this. And of course, that doesn't mean he's looking at the backside. It means he's putting himself under the authority of God's word. Do we actually try to do it? Do we actually know it? Well, I don't, you know what? You know, listen, I am not gonna, we don't even carry Bibles to Bible study anymore. We carry phones. Now listen, I use my phone app every day, okay? I'm not trying to diss anybody here. If you're using your phone right now, it's like, oh no, put the phone away. You know, yeah, I understand the phone has a Bible app on it. But there's something that happens when you interact with your own Bible. It's set apart. And if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles under the pews. Take one. If you want, we'll, we'll find one for you. Because I just think it devalues the Word of God if the only time I'm looking at it is it's right next to Roblox, Instagram, Angry Birds, and, uh, you know, Candy Crush. You know what I'm saying? All right. So we're going to put the Bible on trial. Keep in mind, I am not an expert. I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. No, that's an old joke. You don't get it. Um, but seriously, as a pastor, I consider myself to be a... Um, I'm like a general practitioner, you know what I mean? If I could refer you to a specialist, I put this inside your bulletin uh, for Bible reliability. There's some great books out there that you can look at that can say, hey, you can be convinced uh, if you're really open-minded that this book was written by God. But what I want to do today is give you seven what I'm convinced of, obviously I'm biased, compelling evidence is why you can trust that this book was in fact inspired and written by God. We're going to walk through these seven things quickly. Uh, at the end of the message, we're going to sing a song about the Word of God. Uh, we may not have our normal prayer response time, but there is an application. My application right now up front is that God will do something in our hearts and just begin to turn our hearts once again back to uh, loving, valuing, pursuing, walking, reading, studying, all those things in God's Word. First of all, first evidence, and by the way, there's like an insert inside your bulletin that has a lot of notes on it. You can write these words down, or, and there's some notes you can take home. I want to tell you that the Bible is, is a unique book. It is matchless. There's no other book in the history of the world that is even remotely close to it, okay? It's, and, and, and I'm going to explain this in just a moment here, but it is set apart. First of all, it is the most read book of all time, most translated into every language. If you go back and look at the, the, just about every source on the website that tells you how many books or things have been sold, you know, the former chairman of the Communist Party had a forced distribution and his is the most, but you put the Bible up there and it's off the charts. Okay, over 6 billion copies. Do you know that every year over 100 million copies of the Bible are sold? What that means is if they would allow the New York Times bestseller list to put the Bible on it, it would be first place every year. Okay, every year. Once again, the best-selling book in the world is the Bible. I mean, they get tired of saying that every year because it's true. Now, if you don't know this, the word Bible is not in the Bible. Because the word Bible just means collection of books. Your Bible uh, has 66 books in it. Now, there's a major division in your Bible, and we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? If we're on a timeline here, Old Testament was written before Jesus. Jesus. New Testament after Jesus. Okay? It's pretty simple. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the Jewish language. Now, there's like six chapters in Aramaic, but basically it's Hebrew. The New Testament was written in, you can see it up there, say it. Very good. Thank you. Some of you are paying attention. Do you know of any other book that has 40 different authors on three continents written over 1,500 years? Do you understand what I'm saying? God used 40 different people to write these 66 books over a period of 1,500 years. And we know that all of the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, was translated into Greek 
prior to the time of Jesus. It's called the Septuagint. It was done around 3rd century BC. So all these 39 books, we have 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. All 39 of these books were translated into Greek. So when you look at those 39 books in your Old Testament, again, history confirms that that portion of Scripture has not changed. That is the Hebrew Bible. As far as the 27 books of the New Testament, they were canonized. And the word canon basically means that groups got together, scholars over the years, and said, hey, which of these letters and, and, and gospels and, and writings, which of these things came from God? Which are inspired by God? And they met. And the first time they met, they had chosen 22. And then 22 again. And then 22. And then it went to 24. And by the way, every single time, all four gospels were included. All of Paul Paul's letters were included. And since 367 AD, that's about 1650 years ago, your Bible has not changed. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are no new books. There are no lost books. There is no contradiction for the last. That's just the new thing. Say, oh, well, there's the gospel of uh, Hackensack that's been missing or some weird thing, you know, that somebody wants to go out and put. No, the scripture has been preserved. The Bible has not changed. Um, I put these notes on your outline just again for information so you can see some of the history. In 1228, the Bible was separated into chapters, okay? I hate to tell you, but chapters and verses weren't there. John 3.16 wasn't John 3 and 16. Not until 1551 when the New Testament, they inserted verses in. In 1384, the first English translation of the Bible was uh, d accomplished by hand uh, by John Wycliffe, smuggled throughout Europe. In 1455, the first movable uh, type printed, the Gutenberg Bible, uh, was produced in 1522 to 1534. You might have heard of Martin Luther. It took him 12 years to produce a Bible that would be translated into German. Again, the original language, Hebrew, and Greek. So everything we're reading are translations from those languages into whatever language you're reading. Uh, in 1525, the very first uh, printed version of the Bible came out. William Tyndale, by the way, he was captured, strangled, and burned at the stake. Most of the people who helped produce the Bible died for their faith. They were martyred. In 1535, the first legal translation of the Bible came out, the Coverdale Bible. Again, we're talking 500 years ago. In 1560, the first one that had chapters and verse, the Geneva Bible. It's also referred to as the Pilgrim's Bible, which the Pilgrims brought with them to America many years ago. And then, of course, in 1611, uh, the most famous or most sold translation in the world, the authorized King James Version. And since that time, thousands and thousands and thousands of translations, every known language. People have gone into, um, missionary, uh, missionaries have gone into people groups just to learn their language so that they could speak it and then write it down and then translate it into scripture. There is no other book like this in the world. This book has shaped Western civilization like no other. People have died just for owning or possessing this book. It has been criticized like no other book. It's been under attack like no other book. And yet, even though portions of this were written over 3,000 years ago, even though it was first printed for public use 550 years ago, okay, it has stood the test of time and it is still the best-selling book in the world every year. You understand what I'm saying? This is not just another book. It's the Word of God. Number two, the authentic authentication process. Now, again, I'm not a bibliographer, but the authenticity of ancient manuscripts and documents, they basically look at them and they ask two questions when they've, because we don't have, you know, they didn't have copy machines back then, right? They didn't go to the Xerox and just, you know, people had to, do things by hand. And so all of historical writings before the printing press had to meet certain standards and to be considered trustworthy and reliable. So two main questions are asked. Number one, how many copies of these manuscripts do we have of ancient historical writings? And number two, what is the time gap between the time it was written 
and the earliest dated writing that we have. And again, this, uh, this diagram is on, on that sheet inside your bulletin. You can see it there. But when you look at the time of historical writings, first of all, looking at the number of historical writings, Plato's writings, uh, Caesar's writings, the Gaelic Wars, Homer's Iliad, 643, that's a huge number. New Testament, there's like 5,686. And by the way, there's about 25,000 fragments of the New Testament. In other words, there are more copies and documents of the New Testament in ancient manuscripts than anything else. And when we look at the time gap between like the earliest uh, documented copy and the time it was written, most of those gaps are in the hundreds, if not a thousand years, where the Bible, you're looking 30 to 50 years from there's a dated Bible uh, manuscripts in 125 AD, which is a very short time gap, okay? I don't know if you're getting this, but the variances in texts um, that, that have found, you know, there's variances between this one and that one. Sure, one, uh, you know, like even in your Bible, if you go to Mark 16, there are some ancient manuscripts that don't have the last part of Mark 16, or, or Acts 8, verse 36 and 37 aren't found in some ancient manuscripts, but these aren't things that change doctrines at all. Uh, nothing that changes the doctrine of the faith. But the scriptures that are, have been authenticated so that you know that the Bible you're holding your, in your hands is the most critically affirmed, reliable document of antiquity. Let's talk about preservation, number three. Uh, especially in the Old Testament, the preservation process. In other words, when we look at the Old Testament, which was written, most, most of it was written about 3,000 years ago. How do we know, because this is what people want to say, is they want to say, well, there's just lots of errors because they didn't have copy machines, so scribes fell asleep while they were writing, and they skipped parts, and there's all these different contradictions between the scriptures. That's just not true. The Dead Sea Scrolls have confirmed that, by the way. See, the copying method that the Jews used, one of the things about the Jews is that the, the Hebrews thought that God's name was so holy, they wouldn't even pronounce it. Okay? And, to, and that God's word was so holy that to be a Jewish scribe was one of the most highest educated, honored positions, even though all they were doing, for the most part, was making copies of Scripture. But they had specific methods. The, the number of words on every page could not be changed. Each line on a new page had to be exactly the same as before. The number of letters on that page were compared and contrasted original to the copy. The scribes were not allowed to copy sentence for sentence or word for word, but literally letter for letter. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they, they took their shoes off their feet. This was holy ground when they're dealing. And four scribes would go over every document, each one counting the exact middle word on the page because they believe this to be the word of God. One of the confirmations we have, I mentioned, was the Dead Sea Scrolls. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the earliest dated, now I'm talking Old Testament here, the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures, the earliest dated uh, Masoretic texts we have were 1,000 A.D. We're talking 1,000 years after Christ was the earliest manuscripts that, were, that you're, you're talking a huge gap here, 1,000 years, 1,500 years, 2,000 years from the time of the original writing. So again, the question is, can we trust the Old Testament scriptures that we have. Well, in 1947, a boy threw a, a, a rock in a cave near Qumran, and it shattered pottery. And a discovery was made that they went into 11 caves, and they found um, literally scrolls of parchment. 38 of the 39 books of the Old Testament were found. 11 caves, 19,000 fragments. Okay. The using animal DNA, they did. It took six years to put all these scrolls together. And I mean, they found like 30 copies of the scroll of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy, 19 copies of, of Isaiah. There's something called the Great Isaiah Scroll that was almost the entire book of Isaiah is intact. And when they dated these things, these things were dated not a thousand years, not even after, but prior to. The time Jesus lived on the earth. We're talking two, three hundred years B.C. Are you with me? Okay. So we know for a fact from the Dead Sea Scrolls that everything that you are reading in your Old Testament 
was translated, scribed before Jesus lived. And when they compared those to the the Masoretic texts that were written 1,200 years later, they found them to be 99.2% the exact same. There was no variance between. That's why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important. Now, keep in mind the Dead Sea Scrolls have nothing to do with New Testament. This is the Old Testament Jewish scriptures. But the point is, is that the preservation process, the process by which the scripture was handed from generation to generation was not corrupt and the Dead Sea Scrolls confirmed the reliability of the scripture. Now, with that being said, I get to one that's exciting for me and that is fulfilled prophecy. One of the things that helped convince me that the Bible is the word of God is when you go back to that Old Testament, all the things that were written before Jesus, the Old Testament had all these prophecies that one day a Messiah will come in the future. And now through the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know these things were written before Jesus lived, hundreds of years. Isaiah wrote 750 years before Jesus, and he said, you know what, there's going to be a virgin who's going to be with child. In Micah chapter 5, it says, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. In Zechariah 7, uh, 9, it says, the Messiah is going to ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. In Isaiah 53, check this out. That the Messiah would be rejected by his own people, silent before accusers. God would kill him for the sins of the world. He would die between two criminals. They'd cast lots for his clothing, and he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb. How in the world could all of that be written 750 years before Jesus even lived? You cannot explain that logically. Okay? And there are literally hundreds of prophecies that were written before Jesus came that he fulfilled. These are just a handful. And not just about Jesus, but other things. Isaiah 44 names a king, Cyrus, 150 years before he was born. Ezekiel 26 tells details about the city of Tyre. Uh, and it was fulfilled through Babylon and Greece 300 years later. Daniel speaks of Alexander the Great's rise to power hundreds of years before it happened. And Ezekiel 37 says in the end times, God will raise up a nation called Israel that will be on their same land and everyone's going to hate them. Oh, I wonder if we see that in the news today. These are the things that began to convince me that maybe this book wasn't just another book, that this was inspired and written by God, which led me to realize that the message of the book was also true and that I needed Jesus. Number five, science. Uh, you know, some people have, again, the lie out there today is it's science versus faith. No, it isn't. That's not the truth. Do you know that uh, modern science has discovered things that were already in the Bible? In other words, my point is the Bible records scientific truth hundreds of years before human beings figured out it was scientific truth. Okay? Anthropo anthropo I can't talk. Study of man. Thank you. Bible claims the humans are all one blood. You know, people used to think that different skin colors and races had different bloods and that you couldn't mix. Oh, how about that? Modern genetics have verified there's only one human race. Biology. The Bible claims that God created animals that would reproduce after their kind, after their kind. And what does biology confirm Today, modern biology confirms that creatures only reproduce within their own kind. Uh, geology, the Bible claims that there was a worldwide flood, that all the creatures inhabiting in the, the earth were, were destroyed in that flood, along with the earth. And geology confirms that many rock layers deposited catastrophically bearing fossils uh, within only minutes or hours. Did you know that people used to believe the earth was flat? They did. I know there are some people out there who still do. Shh, don't, don't tell them it isn't. Oh, we didn't discover that till 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he figured out the earth was round. Well, Isaiah knew it about 2,000 years earlier because he said in Isaiah 40, 22, God sits above the circle of the earth. And in Proverbs and Job, it says God inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. Amber alert. Or Jesus wants to talk to you. Job chapter 26, do you know, this picture, by the way, was taken from uh, the, one of the Apollo, I think in December 1972, a real picture looking back at the earth, and there's the earth just floating out there uh, in the middle of space, and in Job 26, Job says, God hangs the earth upon nothing. 
How did Job know that 3,000 years ago? Because God wrote the Bible. The Bible says that the stars of heaven cannot be numbered. People used to think that was a mistake because they would number them all and say, nope, there's only this many until bigger <clears throat> telescopes came into being and they've figured out. You know what's so cool is every time that Hubble builds a bigger telescope, God's like, nope, there's more out there. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bigger God than your telescope is. There is no end of the uh, universe. Which, by the way, the Bible says that God stretched out the heavens. I think there's evidence. This is why people think in a big bang, you know, theory that some, there's an explosion because... <coughs> Again, these things are found in Scripture. Do you know the water cycle is found in Scripture? That as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth, making it barren sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread of the earth, and they return to heaven. These, you know, do you know George Washington, this was like, what, three, 300 years ago? When he was dying, the best science of the time said, you know, he's got bad blood in him. We need to let blood out of his body so he'll be healed. The doctors killed poor George. But if they'd have looked in Leviticus 17, they discovered Moses wrote, the life of the flesh is in the blood. This is how God created mankind. Again, I don't have time to get into this. We're just doing a surface level experiment here. Number six, let's talk about archaeology. Do you know that archaeologists continue to keep finding things that the Bible speaks of? I mentioned a couple of weeks ago the Pilate Stone um, that Pontius Pilate was mentioned. There are over 50 different names of individuals in the Bible that have been confirmed through archaeology. We're talking about names of kings of Israel, kings of Judah, uh, kings of Egypt, uh, Moab, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, that we thought, well, they're just in the Bible, and then all of a sudden archaeologists find items that have their names on it that confirm, oh, these were actual real people that existed. You mean the Bible's reliable? Yeah, how about that? Um, cities, there are like hundreds of cities that the Bible speaks of that have been found. Uh, there are uh, the Tel Dan steel. A steel is a, um, uh, an upright stone inscribed that's used as a monument to, to mention important events. The Tel Dan Steel speaks of the united monarchy of David and his kingdom. Yes, David was a real person, confirmed through archaeology. I didn't need the archaeologist to tell me that. I already knew it because I trust God's word. But the Misha Steel mentions Omri, king of Israel, David. It mentions Yahweh, the God of Israel. The Nabonidus cylinder speaks of Nebuchadnezzar. They've even found the bones of Caiaphas, the high priest, who presided over the trial of Jesus, and his name is mentioned. Again, what we see is that all the evidence points to the Bible being the Word of God. The last one I want to give you this morning to me is probably the most compelling, that if you really begin to read and study this book, there's a unity in this book. There's one, you know, even though, even though we're talking about 40 different people writing this book, can you imagine getting 40 of us together to write a book? Listen, when you get five Christians in the same room, you have 10 different opinions. You'll get that if you think about it. 40 authors. We're talking shepherds, kings, scholars, fishermen, prophets, a military general, a cupbearer. These are some of the different people God used to write the Bible. 40 different people on three continents spread out over 1,500, 1,600 years. Okay? Each human author had a different purpose for writing. Some were recording history, some were giving spiritual more instruction, some were pronouncing judgment. Each author composed from different locations. Some wrote from palaces, some wrote from prison. Some wrote from the wilderness, some from places of exile while they were writing history. Some wrote poetry, some wrote laws, some wrote prophecy, proverbs. And yet, the Bible contains one perfectly consistent message from Genesis to Revelation. How do you explain that? 40 different people over 
all of these different, and there's one message. There's one message of the Bible, and it's the salvation of mankind. There's one hero in the Bible, and his name is Jesus. There's one central event that you can find all over Scripture, not just in the New Testament, and that's the death and resurrection of the Son of God. The Bible speaks relentlessly of mankind's rebellion against God and God's heart to pursue and love and redeem mankind. That message is in every book. How can you explain the unity of Scripture? It's almost as if these 66 books have the same author. Yes. Now you're getting it. That's right. And that's my point this morning. I want to give you one more before we go. This is a bonus one. And it's subjective, but I'll give it to you anyway. And that is the power. The power of this book to change lives. This is unlike any other book. People have been delivered from alcoholism, from drug addiction, from anger, from abuse, from bondage through this book. This book has the power to change your life. The scripture itself says, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't let the world press you into its mold, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. As you take your mind and you begin to look into scripture and study scripture and meditate on scripture and allow God's word to come into you as you spend time in God's word, you're going to be transformed as you begin to think the way God wants you to think. And you're going to be changed from the inside out. Now the world is constantly trying to press us into its mold. And even now so, we carry the world around on our little devices so we can access it 24-7, 365. And there's this competition between the world trying to pull me and press me into its mold and the Word of God. And one of the things I just want to suggest is that if your Bible is sitting on your table somewhere or on a shelf, it's not going to do any good. You understand what I'm saying? You have to kind of go like this. Oh. And by the way, if you've never read the Bible before, that's okay. Everyone has to start somewhere. Can I encourage you not to start at the beginning? Don't start in the Old Testament. Start in the New Testament. Anywhere in the New Testament. Maybe Matthew, Mark, Luke. I prefer John. But uh, any, any book in the New Testament to get you going. Because this word has the power to change your life. And if there's an application this morning that I want to talk about, it is that God would change our hearts. That each one of us would begin to have a heart for the word of God. Let me back that up. Because I want to tell you that this book can save your marriage. Amen. This book can help you raise your children. This book, more than anything, will help you to know God. This book can bring you into heaven and give you salvation and the words of eternal life. This book can end up bringing peace into your heart and joy into your heart. This book can give you direction. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This book can make you a better employee. This book can, can actually help your financial ability. And I'm not talking prosperity gospel. I'm talking the principles of Proverbs like working hard and not spending money you don't actually have and going into debt and things like that. And when you learn to be generous and trust God with your money, God takes care of you and blesses you. This book can free you from bondage. Jesus said, if you continue my word, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. This book can change your relationships. It is a living and active book. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than every two-edged sword. And if you've not experienced that, perhaps it's because it's been sitting somewhere closed. So my prayer is that God would give us at Valley Point Church a heart in our own time. Listen, we just read through the book of Acts in, in, um, in our Bible reading plan. And there's a great verse in Acts chapter 17, I think it is verse 11, that it says those in Thessalonica were more noble-minded than, those in Berea 
were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica because they received the word of God with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. What does that mean? That when the preachers preached the Bible, guess what they did? They didn't just trust the preacher. Can I tell you, don't trust me. Don't get your faith from what I'm telling you. Oh, well, our pastor, he knows a lot of the Bible, so whatever he says must be true. <laughs> Don't get your faith from me. Get your faith from the book. Get your faith here. Check out what I'm telling you. Bring, this is a BYOB church. Not the bottles, you know what I'm saying? I want you to open up your book and check out what I'm saying. I want when you come to church for what you're hearing here to confirm what you've already been reading at home. What God's already been showing you in his word. As the worship team comes up, I want to show you a video. It's been out for a long time. You've probably seen it. It's, it's not a great quality video, but I love this because these are Chinese Christians. It's missionary footage of Chinese Christians in China for the first time receiving Bibles. Okay? They've been gathering together, they've been worshiping, they've been praying, but they never had Bibles before. And when these Bibles show up, they open up the suitcase, and it's like everybody's jumping in like there's treasure inside there. Oh, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. Do you see that? And then when they pull the Bibles up, they're like, they're holding it to their face. Oh my gosh, I've got a Bible. I've got God's word. I've never had this before. I can read the word myself. I can interact with scripture myself. I can know God on my own. This is spiritual food. You can feed yourself. Oh, that God would give us a heart again to treasure his word because this is what we need. Would you stand with me today? Again, I'm not going to ask our prayer team to come forward, but I will ask a couple of you on the prayer team to go back and stand by the sign that says prayer room. And if you're here today and you would like prayer, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. I'll be here after the service. I would love to pray with you as well. But we're going to close this morning with a song, with a prayer and a song. And my prayer is going to be that God will once again stir our hearts. Next week, come back. I'm going to tell you how to carry your Bible. Bring it. Bring it. Let's pray. Father, we don't understand it. But Jesus is somehow called the Word. The Word of God. That's His name. The Word who became flesh. And as we cherish this word, as we know this word, as we spend time in this word, we're spending time with you. And I pray once again, I know that the enemy gets us so distracted, so busy. I know that people are here this morning because they love you and they love your word. But I pray right now that God somehow we would begin to live as if we truly believed that this was your word. That we would open our heart to it. That we would study it. That we would consume it. That we would think on it. We would let it change our minds. We would spend time in it. That we would know it. That we might know you. Thank you for this gift. Even as we've read this morning through the last 2,000 years, most people didn't even have the opportunity to hold this in their hands. There were sacrifices made by generations past of people who gave their life up so that we could have access to your word. What we need is a heart change, God. Creating us a hunger and a desire for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing this song together.